Hitler's death in 1945 was considered to be a great student of the secret doctrine, wrote this Masonic encyclopedia, a new encyclopedia of Freemasonry. Waite translated this book on transcendental magic. Waite also wrote the Book of Black Magic. On the title page, under his name, we find that he wrote a book entitled Devil Worship in France. On page 244 through 248 of the Book of Black Magic, we find detailed instructions on how to conjure Lucifer. I'm not going to read this. I'll leave it on the screen for a few seconds and let you read enough of it. This book was published by the authority of the Supreme Council of the 33rd degree. It has a bibliography listing selected references in the back. It's known as a bridge to light. Here's the title page. And we can see down at the bottom that it was in fact uh, written but with the authorization of the Supreme Council. And it's a fairly recent book, 1988. The foreword by, was by Fred Kleinkinect. We've already seen that. Here's the selected references which are found on page 329 of A Bridge to Light. And we notice down at the bottom that they recommend Manley Palmer Hall's 1928 Secret Teachings of All Ages, an encyclopedic outline of Masonic, Hermetic, Kabbalistic, and Rosicrucian symbolical philosophy. Now we've already seen this book, but it has some additional information about conjuring demons that I want to show you. This is a close-up of the top half of the title page of The Secret Teachings of All Ages. I just wanted to show you the uh, or point out the Rosicrucian word there. And I want you to notice the Rosicrucian connection. Masonic, Hermetic, Kabbalistic, and Rosicrucian symbological philosophy is the other title. This is the full page of the chapter heading on ceremonial magic and sorcery in Hall's book. I'm going to do a, a close-up of the, uh, the left-hand top of the page. Hall writes, ceremonial magic is the ancient art of invoking and controlling spirits by a scientific application of certain formula. And down below he writes, while the elaborate ceremonial magic of antiquity was not necessarily evil, well, believe me, what Hall is talking about here is conjuring demons, and it is extremely evil. On the right, we have page CIII. We're going to zoom in on the center of the left column, and then the top portion of the right column that the section heading here is modus operandi for the invocation of spirits. This is a rather nice way to say the methods to be used to conjure demons. This is the top right portion of the page. I'm not going to read this. I'll let, let you read it. Clearly, this is detailed instructions on how to conjure demons. It's a how-to book. Here is a drawing from the book showing a magician invoking a demon. Notice that he's standing in a magic circle. And on the upper left-hand corner, we've got Baphomet, the goat of Mendez. Notice the symbol that the demon is standing in. It's a circle with a triangle in it. Have you ever seen that emblem before? That's the symbol that's used for Alcoholics Anonymous. If you ever have the opportunity to get a hold of an Alcoholics Anonymous book, Read their concept of God. I think you'll find it highly interesting. How would you go about controlling a demon once it was invoked? Well, the secret teachings of all ages provides an example pact, which is found on this page, CIV. I'm going to take a close-up of the lower left-hand corner, and then the text will continue on the top right corner. It reads, At last a pact is agreed upon. It may read as follows. I hereby promise the great spirit Lucifuge, prince of demons, that each year I will bring unto him a human soul to do with as it may please him. And in return, Lucifuge promises to bestow upon me the treasures of the earth and fulfill my every desire for the length of my natural life. If I fail to bring to him each year the offering specified above, then my own soul shall be forfeit to him. And it's signed, the infant signs the pact with his own blood. Now, this next book is not a Masonic book, and I want to make that perfectly clear. This book is The Satanic Rituals. It's written by Anton Sanzor LaVey. 
He's the founder of the California-based Church of Satan. Notice the symbol that he uses on the front of the book. It's a five-pointed star with two points up, and it's got the goat's head superimposed in it. In the introduction to this book, LeVay writes, the rites in this book call the names of devils. He further writes, if one is truly good inside, he can call the names of the gods of the abyss with freedom from guilt and immunity from harm. The resultant feeling will be most gratifying, but there is no turning back. Now, I've not said that Freemasonry was satanic, but let's see what LaVey says about the satanic rituals. He says satanic ritual is a blend of Gnostic, Kabbalistic, Hermetic, and Masonic elements. Is there any common ground in the Rosicrucian and Masonic teachings which would give us a better understanding of the true nature of initiation? This is from Mackey's Encyclopedia of Freemasonry. The heading is Rosicrucianism, and he says that many writers have sought to discover a close connection between the Rosicrucians and the Freemasons, and some indeed have advanced the theory that the latter are only the successors of the former. Whether this opinion be correct or not, there are sufficient coincidences of character between the two to render the history of Rosicrucianism highly interesting to the Masonic student. This is the mysticism of masonry by Swinburne Clymer. I said before that Clymer was both a Rosicrucian and a Mason. So let's see what he has to say. He writes that the Rosicrucians were the real leaven in all Masonic organizations. Many Masonic writers try to claim that the Rosicrucian order was started by Freemasonry. More about Masonry by H.L. Haywood contains the following on page 7. Haywood writes, There is no evidence that any society of Rosicrucianism was ever organized with that name until a Masonic side order was set up in England late in the 19th century. Is there anything in the literature which would lead us to believe that Masonic initiation is a method to communicate with demons? This next book, In the Proneos of the Temple of Wisdom, by Franz Hartmann, is not a Masonic book. This is from a Rosicrucian source. We are using it here because it is easy to understand, and we will see parallels between it and the next Masonic book. Both Rosicrucians and Masons are involved in initiation. The human soul may be put into a state of sleep so that she will forget her terrestrial conditions and turning her whole being towards her divine origin, she will become illuminated by the divine light and not only be able to see the future and to prophesy it correctly, but also to receive certain spiritual powers. On such occasions, the divine inspiration and illumination may be so great as even to communicate itself to other persons near and to in influence them in a similar manner. Persons in a state of receptivity or passivity, you could read that as the word trance, may become mediums through which divine demons, influences, may be attracted within the body of man and cause men to perform wonderful things. If the soul of such a person breaks away from the bonds of the body and surrenders herself to the power of imagination, she may become the habitation of demons of a lower order, which may enable her to perform extraordinarily things. Thus we may see that a person who has never had any instructions in painting may suddenly exercise that art and produce an artistic work, etc., etc. This book, Emergence of the Mystical, was written by Sovereign Grand Commander of the Scottish Rite, Henry C. Clausen. We can see that Henry Clausen indeed is, was the Sovereign Grand Commander of the Scottish Rite Supreme Council, the Mother Supreme Council of the World. This is a portrait of Clausen. Notice that he also wears the seagull of Baphomet. This is page 70 of Emergence of the Mystical. Notice how the supernatural abilities described in this Masonic book are similar to the Rosicrucian descriptions. For example, Jesse Shepherd, a philosophic mystic who astounded witnesses with his musical performances, sang simultaneously bass and baritone and gave speeches in Arabic, French, Latin, Greek, and, for the next page, Chaldean, when in trance. Charles Linton, a clerk with little education, whose automatic writing was spectacular, and who wrote a monumental book of 100,000 words in four months in a handwriting different than his own. Now, the reason he was able to write it in a handwriting different than his own was because he wasn't really writing the book. The demon was writing the book through his body. This is an example of demon possession. 
And if you'll recall from the book of Acts, there was a slave girl who was following Paul around. She told the future, and, and uh, she brought in her owners no small sum of money. And she was following Paul around, telling the people that uh, this man is telling you about the one true God. And Paul got tired of it and cast the demon out of her. So clearly we have scriptural uh, evidence that uh, shows us that it is possible for a demon to provide spiritual gifts also. This is the Lost Keys of Freemasonry again, page 18. And we read, in Freemasonry is concealed the mystery of creation, the answer to the problem of existence, and the path a student must tread in order to join those who are really the living powers behind the thrones of modern national and international affairs. On page 57, Hall writes, the Master Mason, if he be truly a master, is in communication with the unseen powers that move the destinies of life. Well, what does the Bible say? Who is the unseen power which controls the world? We read from 1 John, We know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. Does the Bible support the conclusion that a method such as Masonic initiation would enable a Mason to communicate with demons? Paul wrote the following to Timothy. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Now it is obvious that for anyone to give heed to seducing spirits and their doctrines, that the doctrines must be communicated from the seducing spirit to man. The Masonic doctrine that a Mason can become a Christ is not of God. It is clearly of Satan the Antichrist. Additional details of the secret doctrine are communicated to Masons by demons while they are in trance. This is page 87 of the Masonic Initiation. The passage we saw before from this book can be understood to agree with the realities as predicted in Scripture. Reading from the bottom of the page, yet in the actual experience of soul architecture, initiation succeeds initiation upon increasingly higher levels of the latter as the individual becomes correspondingly ripe for them, able to bear their strain, and assimilate their revelations. Let's compare the writings of Wilmshurst with Scripture. Yet in the actual experience of soul architecture, initiation succeeds initiation upon increasingly higher levels of the latter as the individual becomes correspondingly ripe for them, able to bear their strain. Paul wrote to Timothy, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. The process of Masonic initiation is one in which the conscience of the individual is seared as with a hot iron. As his spirit is progressively deadened, he is able to bear more and more of the revelations. What is the expected result of Masonic initiation? This is from Ancient Mysteries in Modern Masonry, page 33. We read that initiation, as we shall see in a subsequent lecture, was regeneration, a real spiritual new becoming or rebirth. The candidate himself became the thing symbolized, Hermes, Buddha, Christ, etc. This state was the result of real initiation, an evolution of the human into the divine. The initiate is reborn and has a new becoming. When a man becomes a Christian, he is reborn. Masonry has a similar born-again experience which will literally change a man's life. This is from the Masonic Initiation by Wilmshurst. True self-knowledge is unobstructed conscious union of the human spirit with God and the realization of their identity. In that identic union, the unreal, superficial selves have become obliterated. The sense of personality is lost. Man realizes with his own inherent ultimate divinity and thenceforth lives and acts no longer as a separate individual with an independent will, but in integration with the divine life and will whose instrument he becomes, whose purpose he thenceforth serves. Notice that the Mason becomes unable to act as a separate individual and becomes an instrument of the Masonic God. This is from Ancient Mysteries in Modern Masonry by the Reverend Charles H. Vail. The consummation of all this was to make the initiate a God, either by union with the divine being without or by the realization of the divine self within. The initiate realizes the Masonic God within. He is demon-possessed. He is no longer able to act as a separate individual. He now is an instrument of the Masonic God. He has been filled with an unholy spirit. Drawing titled The Guardian of the Threshold 
is found in Manley Palmer Hall's book, The Lost Keys of Freemasonry. Just a few minutes ago, I showed you some material from the Satanic Rituals written by Anton Stanzler Leve, and he said that if one was truly good inside, that he could invoke devils and they couldn't do any harm to him. Well, there's similar teaching in Masonic books, and this drawing depicts a person that's invoked a demon, and he's able to stand up to the demon because he's, he's good. And we'll see uh, in just a moment in uh, a book by Buck uh, the same concept. This is Buck's book, Mystic Masonry, page 115. And he writes, in genuine initiations into the really occult mysteries, the penalties for unworthiness in any and all directions consisted in the apostate becoming the victim of the powers he had himself invoked. And he writes down further, Bulwer's demon of the threshold may be neither a joke nor a romance, as many cases of obsession recorded in the annals of medicine and spiritualism abundantly prove. We've seen this before. It's from the Great Teachings of Masonry, page 31. With a clear understanding of the secret doctrine, we're now able to understand the true meaning of this passage. The sonic initiation is intended to be quite profound and as revolutionizing an experience. As a result of it, the candidate should become a new man. He should have a new range of thought, a new feeling about mankind, a new idea about God, a new confidence in immortality. Demon possession can do all of that for a man also seen this before. The statements at the bottom of this page are from the Masonic Initiation by W.L. Wilmshurst, and it's also seen to have a profound meaning at this time. We profess to confer initiation, but few Masons know what real initiation involves. Very few, one fears, would have the wish, the courage, or the willingness to make the necessary sacrifices to attain it if they did. Most Masons who are involved with initiation are unaware that they're dealing with demons. J.D. Buck accurately explains why in Mystic Masonry. This is page 59. How much one's idea of God colors all his thoughts and deeds is seldom realized. If your idea of God is not Jesus, you can't see things clearly. What is the purpose of the Masonic Lodge? This is page 186 of The Lost Word, Its Hidden Meaning by George Steinmetz. Steinmetz writes, It is our studied opinion that the objective of Freemasonry is the acquisition of spiritual cognition. That is, possession of the master's word is but another of the synonymous words or phrases for cosmic consciousness. This is from the Great Teachings of Masonry by H.L. Haywood. He writes the following. The fraternity itself exists in order to keep fixed on a man a certain set of influences and to bring about certain changes in the world, etc. Its secrecy is a means to that end and helps to make such a purpose possible. Now it is clear from an understanding of the secret doctrine and of scripture, the certain set of influences he is referring to are demons. What purpose does Satan have for putting masons in churches? Well, in order to keep fixed upon those churches a certain set of influences and in order to bring about certain changes in those churches. The secrecy surrounding masonry is a means to that end and helps to make such a purpose possible. This is from the Masonic Initiation by W.L. Wilmshurst. It's on page 54. He writes, initiation has no other end than this, conscious union between the individual soul and the universal divine spirit. Wilmhurst writes on page 55, the whole purpose and end of initiation, the union of the personal soul with its divine principle, masonry has no other objective than this. All other matters of interest connected with it are but details subsidiary to this supreme achievement. This is page 19 of The Lost Keys of Freemasonry by Manley Palmer Hall. He writes that the Masonic Order is not a mere social organization, but is composed of all those who abandon themselves together to learn and apply the principles of mysticism and the occult rites. We can summarize the secret doctrine at this point. Through the process of Masonic initiation, man may attain conscious union with the God of Freemasonry. The process of Masonic initiation is not a ceremony, but is an internal process which occurs while the individual is in trance. When conscious union is attained, the lost word is found. The man becomes a Christ and thus becomes a God himself. There is not one Christ for the whole world, but a potential Christ in each man. It is far more important to become a Christ than it is to believe that Jesus was a Christ. Each man works out his own salvation by becoming his own savior. 
If a man doesn't save himself, he won't be saved. Since each man can become a Christ himself, they have no use for the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ. Is the knowledge of the secret doctrine confined to only those men who have completed the higher degrees? No, that's a popular misconception. The secret doctrine is not confined to the higher degrees of masonry only. Nothing in the higher degrees reveals the secret doctrine explicitly. The secret doctrine is discovered by reading and reflection. Every master mason has 